Yeah, thanks, Robert. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, it's a, it's a really big subject, this uh, state. I didn't really realise how massive it was going to be. So I'm going to cover a lot of things that I've placed in this document that's on your chairs. But some of this I'm going to really skip over really quite lightly. And the main meat is really going to be on the second page. So apologies if anybody wants more detail on some of the earlier stuff, but really, just time just really uh, didn't allow me to uh, do that. Okay, the title of the talk is Imagine a Boot Stamping on a Human Face, which is uh, from Orwell, uh, or a Given It Straight on Das State, which is my youth angle, which I got from Robert here. <laughs> so when I, when, I, when I think about the state, you know, the capitalist state, I always think of Leviathan, you know, the picture that's on, from, on the front of like Thomas Hobbes' uh, 1651 political work. You know, we've got the, uh, the giant torso of the, uh, the figure of the, it looks like the Sun King or Charles II emerging out of the landscape and he's uh, holding a, say, a scepter in one hand and there's all symbols of power and church and uh, war and conquest all around. But the torso of the, uh, the Leviathan is made up of uh, thousands and thousands of people and that's what I think about when I think about the state. The, the state swallowing up people like the Leviathan in the uh, book of Job, you know, the sea monster. So that's, a, that's the first thing. The state is that Leviathan, it swallows it all up. All up. Uh, people will know that I uh, write the mixed media page, so I'm going to bring a bit of like, so just for the uh, constant culture in, uh, to begin with. Like, so I want to keep these things in mind as you're listening to the talk. You know, uh, you know, novels by Franz Kafka, The Trial and The Castle. You know, the Castle is all about bureaucracy and highlighting the struggle of a protagonist against a bureaucratic system, uh, you know, protagonist standing before the law's door, unable to enter. And the castle, again, is about alienation, unresponsive bureaucracy. You know, the frustration of trying to conduct business, you know, with seemingly arbitrary controlling systems. And also the futile uh, pursuit of an unattainable goal. And, uh, and the trial, very, very well known, a novel by Kafka, it's the story of a man who's arrested and prosecuted by a remote, inaccessible authority. And the nature of his crime is neither revealed to him uh, nor to the reader, it's himself or herself. Uh, another thing I want you to keep in mind, I don't know if people have seen the Terry Gilliam 1985 film uh, Brazil. I mean, this is a dystopian satire on bureaucratic society. It's inspired by Orwell's 1984 and Clearly, uh, Franz Kafka's The Trial and The Castle. So I really need to speak about George Orwell's 1949 novel, very briefly, uh, uh, 1949 novel, 1984. I mean, in this, uh, just some of the themes or some of the things that we come across are like Big Brother is Watching You, the state control of uh, love, sex and marriage. Uh, they have things like the Two Minutes Hate, uh, the Hate Week campaign. They've got two-way television. Uh, the state is um, involved in falsifications, distortions, and plain lying propaganda. There's falsification of history. And always the desired end justifies any means, whatever, how cruel, however despicable. And there's also, in, 90, in the novel, Orwell talks about a historical involvement with the lottery. Which is interesting, because in 1949 in England, we didn't have the lottery. We do now, and there clearly is a historical involvement with that. Also, antisocial crimes were uh, big in uh, George Orwell's novel. And also the proletariat, the working class, uh, are known as proles. And they're, they're subject to inertia. They're badly fed, ill-housed, badly educated, and they're lulled into a servile acceptance of their lot by lying propaganda, cheap music, pulp pornography, and public demonstrations of bogus patriotism. Sounds like today. The, the last bit of like sort of like bit of art and media I was mentioned is uh, is a, a, a novel by Philip K. Dick, the uh, science fiction fantasy writer. He's also made into a film. It's called Minority Report. I was mentioning very quickly that the main thing about that is something called pre-crime, where the police are actually arresting people before crimes are committed because they intend to commit a crime, whether they know it or not. And that will come up later in the talk because we do have elements of pre-crime in our criminal justice system in this world today. Like I say, I'm just trying to go through quickly uh, these uh, earlier places. So, uh, just a bit about Marxism and anarchism on the state. Uh, <coughs> uh, and Marx and Engels wrote about the, the state uh, quite often, and I'll just give a few quotes of what they said, and uh, we'll keep, the, keep those things in mind as we progress in the talk. I mean, that the state is an instrument of class rule by the capitalist class, that is clear. And it's nothing else other than a machine for the oppression of one class by another. As the state arose from the need to keep class antagonism in check, it also arose in the thick of the fight between the classes. 
it is normally the state of the most powerful economically ruling class, which by its means becomes also the politically ruling class, and so acquires a new means of holding down and exploiting the oppressed class. So today, the modern representative state is an instrument for exploiting wage labour for by capital. I mean, the state became a necessity because of this cleavage of uh, classes in society. Marx uh, describes state power as comprising uh, the organs of standing army, police, bureaucracy, the clergy, and the judicature. Now, I'm not really going to speak about all of those things. I'm going to concentrate really a little bit on the bureaucracy, uh, but it's mainly going to be the police and the state surveillance, those I'm going to concentrate on, and state repression uh, through, uh, well, suppose it is through the judicature, it's through the uh, law, when I speak uh, later about what's going on in recent decades. Uh, Engels also a good quote from Engels, he said, the, the state it consists of special bodies of armed men having prisons at their command. Now, Bakunin uh, had, a, had a little bit of a different take on the state, although I, uh, I'll, I'll talk first, though, about, about him and equality <coughs> and, uh, and class. I mean, he said the state has always been the patrimony of some privileged class and that the capitalist state guarantees private property rights, the maintenance inequalities, and it upholds privilege. I mean, the very existence of the state demands that there be some privileged class virtually interested in maintaining that existence. He also wrote, I am properly free when all the men and women about me are equally free. And G.D.H. Cole, a uh, nice little quote on Bakunin, said, he was very far from being an individualist, and he had the most, utmost, utmost scorn for the kinds of liberty that were preached by the bourgeois advocates of laissez-faire. And no one's insisted more strongly than he on the evils of private property and of the competition of man with man. What Bakunin, though, is... Uh, we're very different from uh, Marx and Engels. I don't know, it's, 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 it's the passion word I get, it's the emotion uh, and the, the language that he uses when he talks about the state. And I'll just give you a few quotes. Uh, the state is evil. It was born out of the marriage of violence, rapine and plunder. In other words, of war and conquest. From its beginning, it has been the divine mainstay of brute force and rampant injustice. And by, by state, I'm, I'm reading the capital state here. Uh, he, I mean, Bakunin carries on, like, he says things like, the state is the complete negation of humanity. It is like a vast slaughterhouse or an enormous cemetery. That, that sort of quote I've used, when I've talked about the Paris Commune, I just think that's very appropriate, you know, the state is like a vast slaughterhouse or an enormous cemetery. And also things like the immolation of the individual on the altar of the state. But as you'll see when I go through this talk, you know, we are individually being immolated on the altar of the capitalist state on a daily basis. Uh, Bakunin carries on, it is the most flagrant, the most cynical, and the most complete negation of humanity. There's a nice sort of quote by Bakunin about liberty being curtailed by security, but I'll leave it to uh, a later on, uh, a later section. Put that to the side. So, before I move on to the meat of the subject, I just wanted to like, speak just briefly about uh, Marx as being an anarchist communist. Now, I'm indebted to Comrade Buick from his 1994. Uh, summer school talk at Ruskin College where he uh, talked about Marx and Kropotkin meeting and what they were had to say to each other. So I've just taken this from uh, Comrade Buick's uh, talk of 1994, uh, just some quotes that uh, Adam actually used. So this is Marx, an anarchist communist. Uh, Comrade Buick wrote, once he had become a communist, Marx came to see the state as a false community and as a realm that only needed to exist where individualism was the regulating principle of everyday life. It was an institution that was only needed and only arose out of such conditions in order to restrain economic individualism in case it should tear society apart. So Marx was advocating a society without money and without a state, an anarchist <coughs> communist state, society. So let's use a few quotes from Marx. The working class in the course of its development will substitute for the old civil society and no association which will exclude classes and their antagonism, and there will be no more political power properly so called. so called, since political power is precisely the official expression of antagonism in civil society. And just one last quote that uh, Comrade Buick uses in his summer school talk of 1994, uh, where actually Marx actually uses the, the term anarchy. Now Marx wrote, all socialists understand by anarchy this, the aim of the proletarian movement, the abolition of classes, once achieved, then the power of the state 
which serves to keep the great producing majority under the yoke of a small exploiting minority, will disappear, and the functions of government will be transformed into simple administrative functions. I mean, uh, the, the SPGB uh, found a uh, very good little article from 1957 in the Socialist Standard, uh, entitled The Capitalism of the State, and I'll just read a few bits from that. I mean, there's nothing to say, none of this analysis of the state should really can be faulted at all. You know, I mean, it still stands uh, and can de describe what we are, where we are now. Uh, I mean, we, we wrote in 1957, the state as an organised coercive agency does not in fact emerge until the breakup of early tribalism with its primitive egalitarianism, which was brought about by the development of private property relations and its concomitant privileged and unprivileged social classes. The state as a social power becomes the means of ensuring the continuance of this division. <coughs> Physical sanction by the control of the state over the armed forces, the control of the state machinery in order to perpetuate a social arrangement favourable to themselves. And the state is a particular form of state organisation is the product of a social class or classes which benefit from a particular set of property relations, which it is the state's obligation to enforce. The state is the protector of private property. They mean that it guarantees the class interest of a given set of property relations. Uh, capitalist property relations, private property relations, sorry, means a social relationship between men, a relationship between owners and the means of production, and non-owners. It maintains and enforces these social relations of production that constitutes the primary function of the state. The article also adds uh, the function of the state is to minimise the conflict between the classes to the greatest possible extent in order to maximise social harmony to blunt uh, social antagonisms, class antagonisms. We also point out in this uh, 1957 article that governments have employed the repressive machinery of the state to curb demands of various sections of the working class. In the real world of capitalism, the state remains the guarantor of capitalist uh, property relations. We've got a section here, state capitalism in the 20th century, and um, that's a huge subject in itself, and I'm only going to speak about two minutes on it. Uh, uh, I just wanted to, like, uh, little quote from A.G.P. Taylor in his, in his book, English History, 1914 to 1945, and he talks about what like, the English society and the English state was like in 1914. And he writes, until August 1914, a sensible law-abiding Englishman could pass through life and hardly notice the existence of the state beyond the post office and the policeman. Now, what he sees is that he sees the whole Great War, the First World War, as changing all this. And I'll just give you a little quote from uh, his uh, preface to his book. And he says, because of the war, the Englishman's food was limited and its quality changed by government order. His freedom of movement was restricted. His conditions of work prescribed. Some industries were, were, were reduced or closed. Others artificially fostered. The publication of news was fettered. Street lights were dimmed. The sacred freedom of drinking was tampered with. License hours were cut down. And the beer watered by order. The very time on the clocks was changed. From 1916 onwards, every Englishman got up an hour earlier in summer than they would otherwise have done, thanks to an act of Parliament. And Taylor concludes, the state established a hold over its citizens, which though relaxing peacetime was never to be removed, and which the Second World War was again to increase. I mean, uh, Socialist Party uh, wrote about uh, social state capitalism and uh, said basically that state economic intervention has been a feature of modern capitalism right from the start in the form of state funds for capital projects, subsidies, <coughs> technical research, tariffs, etc. So far from state intervention being a symptom of the system's old age, it actually has on the contrary been a means whereby the various capitalist nations have actually attained a more vigorous uh, economic life. I mean, there has been a in great increase in state activity in the history of modern capitalism. I mean, but the state is bound up with, it, with and inseparable from the general activities of capitalism. And in the 20th century, both uh, Labour and Tory governments adopted certain state policies for the uh, better regulation of the forces of capitalism. But what could be described as socially planned capitalism or state-directed capitalism, even uh, Whitehall capitalism, uh, trying to sort of like organise the chaos of a um, vast state-controlled capitalism. I mean, when I was asked to do this talk, or when I looked at these sort of, uh, some of the questions about the talk, I was sort of saying, well, are there some benefits for the, uh, the, uh, the state, or the state, for the working class? And 
I think, I think, yeah, during the 20th century, there were some benefits of the capitalist state uh, for the working class. I mean, uh, Health and Safety at Work Act, the 1974 Health and Safety at Work Act has been quite a, 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 a huge benefit for working class interests and lives. I mean, other things like the creation of the NHS, uh, the expansion of uh, higher education, uh, comprehensive education, council house building programs, uh, sex, the sex Discrimination Act. All these things took place in the sort of period from 1945 up to the uh, late end of the late 70s. Uh, and in the sort of like the private sphere, we've had we've had decriminalisation of homosexuality, liberalisation of the abortion law, and liberalisation of the divorce law. And also in the mid 60s, we had the abolition of uh, state judicial killing. You know, the ending of uh, capital punishment in this country. So. That's just my little, little take on uh, some of the benefits during sort of state capitalism, really, um, for the working class of the state. I mean, also during the sort of uh, the late 19th century into the 20th century, uh, trade unions uh, basically achieved their, their sort of freedoms and uh, and their activities. Uh, but so uh, you know, uh, that was actually 1906 when uh, trade unions really. Um, were actually uh, got the um, sort of freedom to sort of first strike for really after the Taft Vale Railway decision. I mean, the 1906 um, decision actually led one member of the capital class to say, it is difficult at the present time to realise how this measure must have struck people who still believed in the state and in the legal system that are centred in the institution of private property. For in relaxing the law of conspiracy in respect to peaceful picketing, practically amounts to legalisation of trade union action implying the threat of force and exempting trade union funds from liability in action for damages for torts, which practically amounted to enacting that trade unions could do no wrong. I mean, it's never been an easy ride for the, the trade union movement in this country, because after the 1926 general strike, uh, the government uh, brought in an act where they made uh, secondary picketing, mass picketing unlawful, and the attorney, the attorney general was empowered to sequester the assets and funds of trade unions involved in such strikes. And an incitement to participate in an unlawful strike was made a criminal offence, uh, punishable by imprisonment for up to two years. But this 1927 Act was then repealed by a 1946 Act. <coughs> I will talk later on about trade unions uh, when they really come under attack by the capitalist state uh, in the 1980s and 90s. So I was, I was asked to speak about the uh, changing role of the state. You know, I mean, how has it changed in the last day, 100 years? I mean, compared to um, 100 years ago, I mean, the state now has to negotiate a much more globalised uh, economy. And also, it's been pointed out that the future of the British state seems much less certain in the past, with the recent referendum on <coughs> Scotland's status in the UK, and the debate about whether Britain should remain in the EU. But essentially, this all makes no difference. I mean, whether we have an English capitalist state or a Scottish capitalist state, it makes no difference. I mean, I keep reminded of that quote by Marx, is it better to be exploited by one's own fellow countrymen than by foreigners? I mean, so essentially, the state nature of the state is not changing just because if we're not in the EU or Scotland gets independence or not. But what, what the, the changing role that I've come across is that I've been doing research on uh, the new TTIP arrangement uh, in the global world economy. Uh, the globalisation of uh, capitalism actually is sidelining national governments and states. Uh, there's something called the ISDS, which is the Investor State Dispute Settlement. And this gives uh, transnational corporations the right to challenge a country's laws. And it allows corporations to re receive compensation for the absence of a predictable regulatory environment. And this ISDS uh, mechanism actually creates a parallel legal system independent of national law, allowing transnational corporations to sue governments in special international secret corporate courts over laws or regulations that might prevent or reduce profits. I mean, Transnational corporations call this indirect appropriation. I mean, there's been a slew of publicised ISDS court uh, cases over the last few years. I've, I've got three examples to give to you, which I think are amazing, really. Uh, in 2012, the government of Ecuador decided to terminate its contract with US oil giant Occidental after Occidental sold 40% of its production rights to another company without abiding by its legal ob obligation to obtain government approval. In response, Occidental turned to the investor state dispute settlement provisions in the US-Ecuador Bilateral Investment Treaty. And this allows companies to sue governments through international courts for policies <coughs> that threaten their profits. As a result, the Ecuadorian state was forced to pay out 
$1.77 billion to Occidental, the highest compensation awarded to an investor through ISDS to date. This is despite the fact that Occidental had broken the law in the first place. A second example I just want to give you about this ISDS and how it's affecting uh, individual states today is, is the government of Slovakia. Uh, in Slovakia, they moved to restrict the powers of private insurance firms in the public health system. And a number of health insurance companies actually successfully sued the Slovak government for their loss of profits. I mean, the Dutch firm Acmea is now attempting to use the same powers to block the Slovak government from setting up a public insurance scheme that would provide health cover to all the country's citizens. And uh, the final example I just want to give you is about uh, uh, the Swedish uh, energy company, uh, Vattenfall, who are actually suing the German uh, government for 3.7 billion euros. This is following the decision of the German government to close its nuclear power stations in the wake of the Fukushima uh, disaster. Uh, Yes, yeah, so, the, yeah, so, so, the, so this, that's, that's the big one, really. It's Vattenfall covering and actually suing uh, the German government for, because they're closing the nuclear power systems. So basically, in conclusion about ISDS and, and that, I mean, transnational corporations now can dictate the policies of individual capitalist states. So really, that, the main book of the talk really, is, is really about like, what's happening sort of internally. I'm not going to talk about wars, uh, aggression of uh, states and fighting other states or... Uh, searching out for markets and strategic routes and all that. And I want to talk about internally what's going on. And obviously I'm going to concentrate on this country. I will talk about other countries uh, occasionally. So the first one I look at is like, it's like the rise of the uh, modern capitalist super surveillance state, as it's been described to me. I mean, straight away, it, we, we've straight away into sci-fi territory straight away, and Philip K. Dick's minority report is, is really key here. I mean, the free crime. Uh, traditionally, Criminal justice and punishment, you know, presupposes evidence of a crime being committed, obviously. But we have actually now, punishment has actually been meted out to people for crimes actually never committed. And a clear example of this uh, trend is something called retrospective security detention. And that actually became an option in German criminal law as long ago as 2004. Now, this measure of security was decided upon at the end of a prison sentence on a purely uh, prognostic basis. There was also a similar uh, retrospective measure introduced in France in 2008, uh, known as security detention. The German measure was actually found to be violating the uh, rights, you know, in the European Court of Human Rights. But uh, they've now actually brought in new legislation where they're going to continue this practice, but they're going to call it detention for therapy. <laughs> now, other examples of pre uh, in the prison in the criminal justice system can be found in things like profiling and, and then in the identification and elimination of potential terrorists. So that's on, that's on the European continent. Uh, let's just let me go, I'm going to look at uh, Britain and also at the USA quickly. A couple more examples of pre-crime. Uh, this is I think this is last year. Uh, there's a 20 week study in London uh, actually utilised the uh, predictive software to spot potential gang-related crime before it happened. Now, using this software developed by a company called Accenture, this, pro tar this project targeted individuals across all known gangs in each of the London's uh, 32 boroughs. So with this uh, analytic information in hand, the Metropolitan Police was able to assess the likelihood of known individuals to be offending. And this system made use of data from various crime reporting and criminal intelligence systems used by the Met Police. It was analysed and then used to predict future crime. And risk scores were generated for known previously offending individuals for committing violent crimes in the future. This is an American example. It's something called the Future Attribute Screening Technology Project, or FAST. Now, this sounds like something dreamed up by Philip K. Dick. Now, this has uh, been led by the US uh, Department for Homeland Security. Uh, this initiative aims to use sensor technology to detect cues indicative of malintent, which is defined by the Department of Homeland Security as intent or desire to cause real harm, rapidly, reliably, and remotely. I don't really understand it, really. Uh, the FAST system has the capability to monitor physiological and behavioural cues without contact. That means capturing data like the heart rate and steadiness of the gaze of passengers about to board a plane. The cues are then run through algorithms in real time to compute the probability that an individual is planning to commit a crime. 
the laughter pretty uh, futuristic. Uh, I mean, we all know about CCTV. Uh, I mean, there's elements of 1984 there straight away, isn't there, and Brazil. I mean, it's, it's a number of cameras. I mean, in this country, we've really gone really crazy about it. I mean, the figures, I, I can't get any reliable figure on how many CCTV cameras there are in this country. Uh, I'll just give you two bits of information I've got. There's a 2011 Freedom of Information Act a request, and the total number of local government operated CCTV, this is just local government, was around 52,000 over the entirety of the UK. Another bit of information I found was that an article published in a magazine called CCTV Image estimated the number of private and public operated cameras in the UK as 1.85 million in 2011. Now that works out as an average of one camera for every 32 people in the UK. Although the density of cameras varies from place to place. So I'm just like, I hope I'm not going too fast, but I'm just tearing through these, uh, these, uh, these things. Uh, just little bits of things that I'm, I've, I've just, I mean, when I was thinking about the state, I was like looking around in society, looking at the newspapers every day, and, and just seeing different things. So I just pull out ASBOs. I mean, to me, ASBOs are all, they're all part of this uh, surveillance. I mean, that's a, we all know what they are. They're like civil order made on the balance of evidence against somebody who has engaged in antisocial behaviour. And they were introduced by the Labour government in 1998. I mean, they're described as institutionalised vigilantism or punitive populism. I mean, they really provide a uh, very good example of criminalisation of uh, social policy. I mean, another thing which I'm, I'm horrified, it's just personally as an individual, it's like electronic tagging of offenders. I mean, supposedly in this uh, humane, uh, liberal, capitalist society, and we're, 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 we're tagging people with electronic devices uh, after they've come out of prison, or instead of going to prison. I, I just find it a disgrace, really. But that's just a personal point of view, you know, obviously not critical and Marxist analysis there. And the other day, I, I picked up a leaflet in Battersea, which is in the London Borough of Wandsworth. Uh, it's been delivered to all people's houses, and, uh, and I read it. Uh, I haven't brought it with me, but I just told the interesting quote. So this is a leaflet from the Metropolitan Police, going through everybody's uh, letterbox. And the Met Police wrote, We are concentrating our efforts and resources against, question mark, question mark, individuals who we feel are causing us the most significant problems in this area. The leaflet goes on to say, an attempt preve and to prevent and disrupt the criminal activities of these question mark, question mark. And then he goes on to say at the end of the, uh, the leaflet, one of those question mark, question mark individuals lives in this locality. It's like we're all like really part of this mass surveillance state. We're all supposed to like inform and like dob everybody in, dob our neighbours in if they're like, you know, uh, working and not uh, and claiming benefits at the same time. But uh, uh, that's another example, I think. That's where we are, isn't it? You know, leaflets are like going through the door, like, you know, we're, we're targeting individuals, but we're not going to tell you who they are, but they could be next door, you know, and if you see anything, I don't know. Let me talk, let's talk about um, sort of the online world. I mean, many people find the online world is a place to reclaim some freedom, but here too we're increasingly watched and restricted. I mean, uh, the, the Tor search engine is uh, quite a, a, a famous... Uh, software tool for enabling anonymous communication. Uh, I mean, I want to talk too much about it, but just to let you know that, I mean, the Russian state, for example, is preparing, preparing to move on blocking Tor software, and it might only be a few more years down the line where other countries in the world will start blocking it. I mean, Cameron himself actually talked earlier on this year about banning end-to-end -end encryption in messages. Absolutely crazy statement he made uh, in uh, January this year. I mean, all critics look, looked at it and said, well, it was draconian, stupid, and economically destructive. I mean, encryption, as many of us will know, actually protects uh, online shopping, it, uh, it protects banking, uh, messaging between us, but, you know, things like personal banking and online shopping will be finished. I mean, Cameron said, but in our country, do we, <coughs> do we want to allow a means of communication between people which we cannot read? Yes. <laughs> But, I mean, like I say, it's draconian, it's sort of, sort of stupid, and it would spell the end of e-commerce, private online communications, and any cyber security. But no, notice, nothing's been done about that. I mean, it's just like flying a kite, isn't it, at uh, the beginning of the year. But just showing the intent of like, what the state actually really feels, you know. Anybody who's ever emailed me, you know, or I've, I've received emails from me, will know I've got my email address at riseup.net. Uh, and again, this is, a, this is a, a server that is actually targeted by the state. I just want to give you an example of what happened in December last year in uh, Spain. 
I mean, 14 houses and social centres were raided by the Spanish police in uh, various cities. And the police took away books, leaflets, computers, and 11 people were arrested and sent to a special court handling issues of national interest in Madrid. <coughs> uh, th these individuals are accused of incorporation, promotion, management, and membership of a terrorist organisation. And the judge said, I'm not investigating specific acts, I'm investigating the organisation and the threat they might pose in the future. Again, making this another case of what? It's, for, it's a preventative arrest, isn't it? Nothing's been actually committed. Now, four of the detainees have been released, but seven have been jailed pending trial. Now, the reasons given by the judge for their continued detention included the possession of certain books. And this is a quote. The production of publications and forms of communication and the fact that the defendants used emails with extreme security measures, such as the Rise Up server. <laughs> I mean, this is Kafka's criminalisation of social movements and uh, the ludicrous and extremely alarming implication that protect, protecting one's internet privacy is tantamount to terrorism. I mean, Rise Up, like any other email provider, has an obligation to protect the privacy of its users. Many of the extreme security measures used by Rise Up are common best practices for online security, and they're also used by providers such as Hotmail, Gmail or Facebook. However, unlike these providers, Rise Up is not willing to allow illegal backdoors or sell our users' data to third parties. So just, just to move on a bit to, uh, I mean, Snoopers charges, you know, they've, they've been in the news a lot this year. I mean, there's been a counter-terrorism bill going through Parliament. Uh, new powers are going to require telecom operators to retain data and disclose it to relevant public authorities so that they can read, copy and analyse it. And also the regulation of the Investigatory Powers Act would strengthen bulk interception of the content of uh, communications. I mean, the spying, surveillance, espionage, it's big business. Uh, I just want to give you a couple of facts here. I mean, BT and Vodafone, they collect huge fees for giving GCHQ illegal access to their fibre optic trunks. And also remember Edward Snowden, he didn't work for the CIA or the NSA. He was actually a contractor for a company called Boo, Boaz or Booz Hall, Allen Hamilton. And this company had a turnover of 5.4 billion US dollars in 2014. So spying on us all may not catch terrorists, but it will make military contractors and telecoms companies lots of money. So mass surveillance is actually a policy with a business model. It's a business in capitalism with the name of profit. I just want to talk about quick, quickly about something called metadata, which I didn't know what that meant, actually. Um, I mean, all these, uh, the drone attacks that we hear about by the US, and also Britain as well, in uh, Pakistan and Yemen. I mean, directed uh, use by the CIA using metadata, and people who are supposedly terrorists like Taliban or Al-Qaeda are killed by it. metadata. It's like a, I think it's a unique identifying signal that's transmitted by a mobile phone's radio, similar to a mobile phone's radio chip. So a drone homes in on that phone and kills anybody in this vicinity. I mean, that's the type of intelligence open to error. Never mind just the plain human visual intelligence error. In the case of uh, Jean-Charles de Menendez, he was travelling from Tulse Hill via Brixton to Stockwell in uh, 2005 and identified incorrectly as a, uh, as a terrorist. So just to finish off on uh, surveillance, I was going to ask a quote from uh, Foucault. Well, not quote from Foucault, just someone up there uh, saying it's about him. He actually, he actually famously observes that isn't, there is no need for the place of surveillance to actually be occupied. The effect of not knowing whether you will be observed or not produces an interjection of the surveillance apparatus. You constantly act as if you are always about to be observed. Okay. Just a second. So I've entitled this section the capitalist state today in the, in the era of, in the era of uh, neoliberalism. I mean, what, what, what I've seen is uh, that with all, well, with all the major economic restructuring, I mean, force is necessary by capitalism to move the developing situations towards a new balance of class relationships more favourable to the capitalist class, and it's never death or pain free for the working class. I mean, as capitalism became more unfettered in the 1980s and since. The capitalist state has relied more on its own forces, the police, to ensure the new economic relationships are accepted. And significantly, although statistics claim crime is going down, 
the prison population has doubled in size in the last 30 years. Now, I'll, I'll speak briefly about the prison population a little bit later when we get to, uh, yeah, later on in this section. Actually, it's quite soon, actually. So today we've got uh, austerity economics um, in uh, Britain, but also dissent is actually ruthlessly quite dealt with. Uh, what I've written here, actually, I wrote while the coalition government was in power, actually, it was to do something else. But uh, So dissent is actually ruthlessly dealt with. I mean, police threatened to shoot uh, protesting students. I mean, the uh, 2011 social breakdown in the inner cities resulted in, obviously, political sentences for rioters. And also, I mentioned the concept of pre-crime is now used. Uh, to prevent any dissent against the bourgeois consensus of, because I wrote it in this year, Royal Wedding, Diamond Jubilee and the Olympics. You know, people like uh, Chris Knight, the anthropologist, was, uh, was arrested and a lot, a lot of other people were arrested who were planning to protest against, say, the Royal Wedding or the Royal Christening or whatever the bourgeois crap it was. And uh, people were actually arrested in advance by the Metropolitan Police of actually committing any offence. Just to move on. Uh, so the neoliberal capitalist free market is they speak about the dead hand of the state, rolling back the frontiers of the state, ending state capitalism, you know, they attack the nanny state and things like that. But the irony is, and contrary to all their hopes, the, the neoliberal hopes, you know, the free market capitalists, there's not been any withering away of the state. Uh, I mean, it's just been a stripping back of the state to its core military and police functions. I mean, in Britain, for example, police numbers have actually doubled in the last 30 years. And again, like I said a few minutes ago, uh, crime, crime is supposedly going down, and the prison population has doubled in that same period of time. But also, uh, uh, the capitalist class, <laughs> even though they, they, they hate the state, supposedly, the, cap the state, capitalist state, or whatever you want to call it, uh, but at the time of the 2008 financial crisis, at the invitation of the capitalist class, the state rushed in to shore up the banking system. In the USA, for example, $700 billion emergency bailout. I think in Britain it was in the, or in the realm of £500 billion pounds was provided to the banks by the state. Yeah, so I spoke uh, briefly, so I mentioned the prison population. Yeah, let me just give you some figures, because this is just, it's just uh, bizarre. Uh, I mean, the prison population in this country uh, has leapt between 1990 and 2000, when the numbers increased by about 50%, just a 50% increase just between 1990 and 2000. And again, increased by 10,000 between 2000 and 2004, and then another 10,000 between 2004 and 2010. Let me just put that, make that a bit clearer. So 1980, 42,000 people in prison. 1990, 45,000. 2000, in the year 2000, 65,000. 2004, 75,000. 2010, 85,000. And because I got these figures a few years ago, uh, 20, 20, September 2011, 87,000. I think, I think the maximum, I think it's a breaking point, isn't it? There's like, there's like no places left. But they are talking about building more. Like I said earlier, in the 90s and the 2000s, we were told crime rates are, are dropping, but more people are going to prison. Are the working class actually committing more crimes? Well, I say no, no. The state has actually increased the number of laws, and police are targeting more people to send to prison. There's a criminalisation of poverty, the vulnerable, the non-productive <laughs> members of capitalist society. But what it shows to the public, and, and the media actually carry this out, it shows that the state and the police are actually managing crime effectively. I mean, crime and crime control are part of the capitalist state control policy. So this, this world that we live in now, in 2015, really, uh, this sort of neoliberal world and also this... Uh, with, the, with the increasing the state uh, repression, it really begins in the 1980s. Uh, the first thing I can think of, uh, really, is uh, the, Warrington print, print, the Warrington print dispute, which was 1983 to 84. I mean, paramilitary riot policing was actually used for the first time in an industrial dispute on the British mainland. And also the miners' strike, which I will come back to a little bit later in my section called Police Crimes Against the Working Class. And then we've got the Wapping Printers' Dispute, as well, in the 86, 87. Another thing I wanted to talk about, though, is, uh, you know, is the alternative society, you know, the, the New Age travellers, the peace convoy, people who may remember them from the 1980s. I mean, they grew out in the counterculture of the late 60s, early 70s. I mean, and they were targeted, really, really targeted hard by the British state in the 1980s. You know, people forget about uh, what actually happened. I'll just give you just a few examples. I mean, uh, riot police, fresh from Orgreave in uh, June 1984, <coughs> where they'd been bashing miners over the head, 
then, then went to a, a place called Nostol Priory near Leeds, where a, the peace convoy were actually located, and busted some heads there, you know, and made 360 arrests of like hippies and other uh, uh, New Age uh, gypsies, or whatever you want to call them. <clears throat> and then later, in uh, February 1985, uh, we have an incident at RAF Molesworth. And this was a, a campaign, that, this was an organ... Um, a military police uh, campaign that was organised five months in advance and actually headed by Heseltine. Uh, 1,500 troops and police uh, were deployed to secure the seven mile station perimeter for the MOD. And for the Royal Engineers, who were involved, it was the largest operation since the bridging of the Rhine in 1944. Uh, Defence Secretary Heseltine arrived by horror helicopter wearing a camouflage jacket over his suit. You may remember the images in the media. I mean, the total cost of this operation was in the order of £6.5 million, this is in 1985. All to, uh, all to move 150 people uh, who were in a peace camp, basically New Age peace convoy travellers. I mean, this in, these incidents, and also the Battle of the Beanfield, which took place in the summer of 1985, were all part of a wider political and economic agenda for the restructuring of capitalism in the 1980s. Uh, I mean, even like uh, some Tory... Um, uh, Peer, the Earl of Cardigan, who saw the, uh, the attacks on these uh, New Age travellers, uh, was uh, horrified. And he, uh, you know, I mean, obviously he made statements to, to the police about it and everything. And he was called a class traitor by the Daily Telegraph for going on the side of uh, you know, New Age travellers. <laughs> anyway, that's it. I've got that information for, it's an unfinished article for the Social Standard, which I've actually been writing since 2012, but uh, I'll try and get it finished before the end of this year. Because you know, this year is the 30th anniversary of the Battle of the Beanfield. Anyway, moving away from uh, the Peace Convoy and all that, let me just talk a bit about um, you know, like some acts of Parliament that I actually brought in in the 80s. And this is, this is, this is really significant. This is what we're living with today. I mean, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, 1984, perfect year for it to come out. I mean, it gave considerable extra powers to the police. I mean, police, police powers to search an individual or premises were uh, uh, extended including the, the powers to gain entry to premises. And in this uh, act was actually, um, I think the key factors actually leading to this act were the 1981 Brixton riots and the subsequent uh, Scarman report. Now the 2005 Serious Organised Crime and Police Act is actually an update of the 1984 Police and Criminal Evidence Act. And again, police powers are significantly extended and, and powers of arrest are simplified. <laughs> I mean, the Public Order Act of 1986 I mean, this is, this is the draconian, I mean, and this is what we're living in now. I mean, people have forgotten what it was like before these acts of Parliament uh, actually went in. You know, it's actually much more easy to, like, stage a demo, hold a public meeting outside on the street. I mean, the, the Slotis Party could not really conduct an outdoor meeting now. It would be against the law under these sort of acts. You'd have to actually inform the Metropolitan Police or whatever Chief Constable to say you intend to hold a public meeting on the corner of, say, I'm, I'm talking about Batsy, on the corner of Falcon Road and uh, uh, Batsy Park Road. But in, in the old days, uh, the, you know, the SPGB would just go to the corner of that road and hold a public meeting, and everything would be fine. So the 1986 Public Order Act, I mean, this act abolished common law offences of riot, rout, unlawful assembly and affray, and create criminal offences relating to public order. But the key things for, like, for freedom of assembly are, like, advance notice <coughs> of public processions requiring at least six written days' notice given to the police before, before they held the procession. And it had to include details of the intended time and route, give them an address of at least one person proposing to organise it. And it can create offences for the organisers of the procession if they do not give sufficient notice, or if the procession diverges from the notified time or route. A later sort of public order act is the, uh, is the 1994 Criminal Justice and Public Order Act. Now, this substantially changed the right to silence of an accused person, allowing for inferences to be drawn from that silence. And it gave the police greater rights to take and retain intimate body samples, and increased police powers of unsupervised stop and search, a collective trespass and nuisance on land, and included sections against raves, which included the sort of important notorious repetitive beats definition, and there was further sections against disruptive trespass, squatters and unauthorised campers. More significantly, it criminalised previously civil offences. Now, this affected many forms of protest, including hunt sabotage and anti-road protests. I mean, John Savage, who'd written a lot of books on uh, youth culture and music, I mean, he said about this sort of legislation, well, it's about politicians making laws on the basis of judging people's lifestyles, and that's no way to make laws. 
I mean, the Act was described as a piece of legislation which was explicitly aimed at suppressing the activities of certain strands of alternative culture. The main targets being squatting, direct action, football fan culture, hunt sabotage, and the free party. I spoke about trade unions earlier, and well, they've, you know, they've got significant protections within like, uh, the state capitalist era of uh, the state. But, uh, I mean, the first sort of major attacks on uh, trade unions come in the early 1970s when uh, the Heath government uh, brought in the 1971 Industrial Relations Act. And well, this, this, this act was crazy because it made all slack action actually become unprotected. I mean, and this is a position which even from the point of view at that time of the bourgeois liberal class was untenable. I mean, the act was actually opposed by a union mass action in, uh, afterwards, and it was repealed by the Labour government in 74 which restored the protection afforded by the 1906 Act. But it's, it's in the 1980s and uh, 90s, where which is the, the capitalist class, uh, in, with the Thatcher government doing the work, did it a bit differently. Instead of just like creating one act, they did it piecemeal throughout the 1980s and into the 1990s, basically attacking trade unions and uh, you know, narrowing with different acts, so sort of a narrow picketing immunity, reducing secondary action immunity, Secret ballots imposed for union elections and strikes, offences, or even the Public Order Act, which I mentioned earlier, creating offences related to picketing and increased police power over groups of over 20 people. Uh, other uh, acts of parliament restricted uh, time off for uh, union uh, duties, and uh, removing the closed shop, secondary actuary protection, and things like that. Um, but it was all consolidated in the 1992 Act uh, under the major government. Now, this legislation is a gift for the capitalist class and it's a minefield for trade unions in order to conduct lawful industrial action. I mean, it's bewildering uh, complex balloting and notification purchase procedures. I mean, the law allows the capitalist class to sue trade unions for damages if they can show that industrial action is unlawful. The uh, capitalist class is also entitled to sack workers involved in unlawful or unofficial action. And trade unions are placed in a position of having to re-ballot, by which time they're the momentum of history can uh, dissipate. And again, you will be aware that uh, this new government that's been elected uh, a couple of months ago plans to even reduce uh, trade union powers that, that, that exist already even further uh, by introducing minimum 50% turnout thresholds for strike balance, insisting at least 40% of workers vote for strikes. I think they're also going to actually make picketing criminal, uh, criminal activity and employers will be allowed to hire agency staff, which at the moment is illegal, to actually replace striking workers. Yeah, just quickly on the bureaucracy, and then we'll get to like, the working class and the capital state and the police. Yeah, so we're making the case against like, state capitalism or socialism, uh, you know, neoliberal capitalist ideologues, you know, they excoriate the top-down bureaucracy, which supposedly led to institu institutional sclerosis, and inefficiency in command economies of state capitalism. So with this triumph, so-called triumph of new neoliberalism, bureaucracy was supposed to have been made obsolete. You know, it's a relic of state capitalism. Now, but as, as we all know, this is at odds with the experience of most people living and working in capitalism in the 21st century. Bureaucracy remains very much part of everyday life. I mean, it's changed its form in some ways, because it has, in fact, uh, proliferated. I mean, we've got new kinds of bureaucracy like aims and objectives, outcomes, mission statements, I mean, targets have proliferated alongside additional layers of management and bureaucracy. You know, workers are, their, their performance are assessed and forms of labour which are really resistant to quantification in our post 40s capitalist world. So, neoliberal societies are new control societies. I mean, this is where I think of Kafka. He's the prophet today of uh, control societies. I mean, anybody who's ever had to ring a call centre and have to like, solve our problem, I mean, it's like a Kafka esque labyrinth. You know, one feels like. Joseph K, you know, trying to like sort out some problem on the phone. I, I find it really difficult. I, I tried to avoid ringing anybody like British Gas or uh, you know Thames Water or anything like that because it is it'd be just, just a nightmare. But that's my personal Joseph K feeling. Yes. Yeah, so security, not liberty. I also I like this quote from uh, Kunin, which I, I, I was going to say earlier, but I pulled it out. Uh, and he says something like. It will be argued about the state, the representation of the public will or of the interests common to all, curtailed to part of everyone's liberty in order to assure the remainder of this liberty. 
But this remainder is security. It is by no means liberty, for liberty is indivisible. A part of it cannot be curtailed without destroying it as a whole. I mean, what we've got now is the fear of Islamic fundamentalism lead, has led to an increase in the power of the capitalist state. I mean, authoritarian measures are everywhere in place, are implemented within political structures that remain notionally democratic. I mean, the war on terror has like prepared, pre sorry, prepared us for this development. And we've got a normalisation of crisis, and it produces a situation in which the repealing of measures brought in to deal with an emergency actually becomes un unimaginable. I mean, after the, um, well, the shootings at Charlie Hebdo in uh, Paris in January 2015, I mean, obviously, lots of different things happened in different countries around uh, Europe. I just want to focus on Belgium, because I just think it's quite interesting, because after that incident, uh, the Belgian state started deploying hundreds of troops, to, hundreds of army troops, to patrol the streets, after the Scootish forces supposedly smashed a suspected Islamist uh, terrorist cell <coughs> planning to kill police officers. You know, and up to 300 soldiers were deployed in Brussels and the northern city of Anvers. And so it was also sent to the industrial eastern city of Verbia. But I thought it was interesting because this has just came to us a few weeks after, in Belgium, there had been a massive general strike where 120,000 workers actually marched in uh, Brussels. And it actually led to, uh, you know, dock workers actually clashed with police officers who responded by using water cannon. And, you know, so Islamic fundamentals, the fear of it, you know, you know, we've got troops on the street. A few days before, we've got like, people on the street you know, protesting about economic inequality. Next thing you know, there's army on the streets. So they say that like, they're curtailing liberty in the interests of security. But it's interesting because the Metropolitan Police has a uh, unit called the Domestic Extremism Unit, and it's part of the Counter-Terrorism Unit. Now, Domestic Extremism Unit. Now, you think it's obviously going to be like targeting homegrown jihadists, you know, it's in Bradford, it's in Birmingham, it's uh, in uh, London, in the, working in the Muslim community, monitoring that. But no, no, the domestic extremism unit is monitoring class war. Now, class war, uh, you know, Ian Bones' uh, anarchist organisation, you know, since they started the Kuadors campaign last October in London, they've been, like, they've been monitored and followed by this unit and uh, the Metropolitan Police. And also, their public profiles raised, have been raised a little bit because of this poor doors campaign, and also because of this sort of candidates in the general election. So they, they, were, they, were, at a, they were at an anti-gentrification uh, demo in Camden a couple of weeks ago, and the domestic extremism unit are there monitoring class war. There are, there are a bunch of like, middle-aged women, an elderly man with a walking stick, uh, a transvestite, <laughs> Seriously, you know, but just the, the whole presence actually frightens the state. And they're, they're just symbolic, they're like anarchist pranksters. And uh, Lisa McKenzie, she's an academic, she works, she works at the LSE, and she's also a class war activist. She's also a candidate uh, for class war in Chingford, standing against uh, Ian Duncan Smith. So when class war were in Chingford uh, a few months ago, the police were actually obviously monitoring them, walking through the town centre of Chingford. But the police were actually, this is what I've got from people who were there, the police were actually going up to members of the public and saying, are you offended or are you distressed by these class war banners? <laughs> and I'll just give you some instances. These class war banners are politicians, old fucking wankers. <laughs> and we have found new homes for the rich, with an image of numerous graves on the banner. <laughs> <laughs> now these images, class war, have been, they've been using them for years, you know, even since the 1980s. But they now seem to be deemed a threat to public order, and therefore private property and the capitalist class. I was just thinking about, I mean, we've got a banner which says no peace between classes. I mean, I know it's not as extreme as what class war is saying, but it, that's, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty hardcore. We don't, we're not, we don't want peace between the classes. And when we obviously stand for abolition of the wage system, abolition of capitalism, the abolition of private property rights, in some ways, these are uh, sort of extreme uh, demands in, uh, in, in capitalism. So I'm, I'm recently you know, following in the media, uh, I mean, Cameron, I think, I think he spoke in Birmingham, didn't he? He was actually in Birmingham last Monday, talking about uh, counter-terrorism bill and extra powers uh, to uh, limit the spread of extremism. Uh, Home Secretary Theresa May, uh, she said ahead of Cameron's speech last Monday that the strategy would include uh, new legislation likely to include powers to take action against individuals or groups who are considered to be espousing extremist views. Now, she denied it would uh, constitute an attack on freedom of speech. We're not talking about curbing free speech, she said. 
We recognise that free speech is one of our values. But what we are saying is that we have to look at the impact that some people have in terms of the poisonous ideology that they are trying to implant in people's minds. Let's just move, that's what Theresa May, she's just giving the, she's doing the John the Baptist bit for uh, Cameron turning up in Birmingham on Monday. So he says, we need to put out of action the key extremist influencers who are careful to operate, now this is where I get this, just inside the law, but who clearly detest British society and everything we stand for, just inside the law. So what we're going to do, we're going to move the goalpost so then we can prosecute these people. At the moment it's legal. And in his speech, uh, Cameron, he attacked the National Union of Students for allying himself with an advocacy group called CAGE. Now, this is, this, is a, this is a bona fide group. I mean, it's based in London, and it's obviously got an Islamic focus. I mean, it, it highlights some campaigns against state policies developed as part of the war on terror. And he works closely with uh, former detainees held by the US, and he campaigns on behalf of Muslim prisoners, including convicted terrorists. I mean, a few years ago, Cameron talked about, I mean, I don't know his first name, he's called Chowdhury, and he, he's obviously an Islamic uh, sort of fundamentalist. But again, he's operating inside the law, and the British state doesn't like this because we can't prosecute them. And he says, said about Chowdhury in 2010, he's one of those people who needs to be looked at seriously in terms of the legality of what he's saying, because he strays, I think, extremely close to the line of encouraging hatred, extremism and violence. And as you know, you know, the present government actually wants to replace the 1998 Human Rights Act, which incorporates the European Convention on Human Rights with a British Bill of Rights. I mean, this British Bill of Rights, there's no, been, no details been put out about it yet. Um, I mean, from what bits I've managed to glean, it, it proposes that the rights of an individual would depend on whether they were a British citizen, i.e. full fundamental rights, or you're an EU national, you get fewer rights, or you're a foreigner and you get even less rights. I mean, this is just inconsistent with the, end, the whole notion of fundamental human rights. And then we can get rid of like, anybody who's just straying within, who's within the law at the moment, we can get rid of them. 